our experiences and our upbringing and the things that we suffer change us and affect us and we develop through what happens to us. It's important to look at that. Well, I'm very excited to do this. Uh, you and I go way back. This is a gallery of how to live. Wow, that's uh, that's quite, yeah, that goes back a, quite a way. Yes, yes, I remember that. Yes, I remember that we, uh, we went back to talking about Montaigne. I remember that. Well, it, it's one of my absolute favorite books, and I think about it all the time. And I also got referred by you to... Zweig's uh, little biography of Montaigne, which um, I loved, although I reread it in 2016. And then I reread it at the beginning of the pandemic. And it was both very reassuring and very terrifying and depressing at the same time. I'll have to reread that too, because yeah, I mean, I haven't read it since I was working on the Montaigne book. And uh, yeah, I I wonder. I think it, I'm sure it would re reread it a bit differently now, like a lot of things. Well, I, I think that's kind. Of, I think that's kind of the theme of a lot of the characters in all of your books, which is as the world tears itself to pieces and seems more and may, more chaotic or dysfunctional or violent, a certain breed of people turn inward and. Uh, produce beautiful, wonderful, lasting things as a result of those explorations. Yeah, yeah, that is a thing. Sure. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about Montaigne, uh, if you have the time, which is, so my, fa my favorite thing, or one of my favorite things in the book is you talk about the, the sort of the quotes or the mottos that he has uh, on the ceiling beams in his in his library, his sort of philosophical um, principles or the things he builds his life around. What are some of yours? If, if you had to, if you, if you had such a room and you were carving the, the philosophical principles that have affected you the most, what would you put on yours? I, I, you know, I don't think I could ever settle on any, anything because as soon as I did, as soon as I like started you know, actually immortalizing it on on the roof beam. I'd start thinking, oh, but maybe, I don't know, do I really agree with that? And what happens if I change my mind? I'm going to have to change all the roof beams in my house. So, no, I mean, there are some that I like that, that he liked too. I mean, this um, uh, famous one from Terence, I am human and find nothing human alien to me. That was a favorite one of of Montaigne's and was on his roof beams. Um, you know, I think I could live with that. Um, it might be a good reminder as well if I do start thinking that there are people are doing things that I just can't understand and can't can't cope with. It's probably quite a kind of useful reminder when you look at some of the things that are going on in the world. Too. Well, it isn't one of them. Uh, isn't one of Montaigne's uh, undecided from Sexus Empiricus? Uh, that's that sounds like you might agree with that one also yeah yeah um I, yes i suspend judgment i think that's uh you know that was his part of his his motto um of course i suppose you could take that too far i mean you can't maybe there's a place for saying no no i am going to make up my mind i do think this interesting question i mean we were you mentioned stefan zweig one of the things that he identified as being a bit of a problem with the humanistic, you know, a lot of humanist writers, including Montaigne and Erasmus was particularly who he was talking about, was that um, th there's a kind of weakness that comes from always seeing the other s side, always seeing another point of view and and not being prepared to just come right out and say, right, I think this and that's the end of it, you know, this. so he was particularly talking about that context of the rise of Nazism and humanists being a little bit as Erasmus had been during the terrible wars of the 16th century, being um, just not knowing how do you respond to that? What do you do? How can you stop it? How can you oppose it effectively? And I mean, you know, that's a problem that arises for many generations, including our own, I think. Uh, 
Well, that, know, that's sort of the, the I don't paradigm. think humanists are necessarily any worse than anybody else or most people at, at deciding what to do about it. But Well, that's sort of the paradox is that you can retreat from the chaos and the unpleasantness of the world into the world of ideas, um, but you can't... Um, you can't entirely retreat or in a way you are complicit in or um, uh, endorsing those, the, the, the things that are happening in the outside world by refusing to take a stand or get involved. This is one of the things I, I find most interesting in Seneca's writings. He's sort of saying that, you know, the difference between the Epicureans and the Stoics is that the Epicureans sort of retreat into the garden and the Stoics sort of don't believe that they fully have that luxury, that they have to participate in public affairs. And there's sort of a tension between, I guess, living in the world of ideas and living in the world of, of man. Yeah, I mean, it is the classical distinction, isn't it, between um, the, the kind of the life of leisure and the life of business, but given a political application. Um, and, you know, there are famous lines like, who was it who said, all that it takes for for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, it, there's definitely there's. I don't I don't know if there's a very neat and clear answer to that. I think we all kind of also even in one lifespan, it's not that you come to one definitive statement or conclusion about how you're going to respond to the world and how how far you're going to be involved or not. I think you have different mixes of that at different stages of your life or at different situations call forth a different response. You can get people who um, sort of live a very private life, but finally they draw the line somewhere and say, right, thus far and no further, I'm going to go out and engage with the world. In humanism, I, I, for example. Yeah. I mean, there's a, well, I was just going to say there's a, there's a long tradition of, which comes again from, writers like Cicero and Seneca, the idea of uh, civic humanism was the phrase that was used um, by by some historians to that to be a good humanist means to be engaged with the world and engaged with the life of the polis. You can't withdraw um, and just call it a day and say, right, that's it. Uh, so, yeah, there is there are well, different there, traditions there. And and I'm sure we both know people that are so wrapped up in current events or news as it is breaking in real time that they actually don't have that sort of philosophical perspective. They haven't immersed themselves in the big ideas. It's almost foreign to them that Montaigne 500 years ago could have been thinking about this exact thing or Cicero 2000 years ago has an essay about this exact topic. And so I do think it's a tension between, you know, being informed about what's happening in the world around you and also understanding the ancient world and the wisdom that comes to us through those ancient and timeless ideas. Well, they were struggling with the same things, but there are some things I think in the modern world that do um, slightly change the balance or raise new problems. And one of them is, is the, technology so sure. there's a very modern problem i think that a lot of people well i know i've had it of becoming addicted to the news or addicted to scrolling through the social media feeds for you know because of political events sure. um, and a kind of state of perma crisis in which you know you always feel like you have to know the next thing but how much of that is is turning itself into meaningful action is yes a good question and how much of it is just totally destabilizing our mental health and causing immense anxiety without ever translating into action. So I think it's all, it's more important than ever to think, as you say, with looking back to authors of the past, but to think about how we manage that balance and to be even a little more deliberate about how we engage with that constant stream of news from the world and often bad news from the world. I know I certainly have struggled with that at various times in the last few years. And I, I think Montaigne is a good example too of, you know, 
questioning one's assumptions about things. So not hearing something that happens in the news and immediately forming an opinion about it or uh, believing this about human nature or believing this about people and just sort of taking it for granted. But he also by giving himself that space by his retreat a little bit and his sort of withdrawal from public life, which is ultimately resumed later when he takes political office. But um, he he really questions what it means to know something and he questions his own assumptions and he really thinks about the issues and uh, who people are and what's important and how things work. You know, so often I think today we're firing off opinions the second we get the, the information and this leads to a lot of what they call hot takes, but they're not very valuable takes. Yeah. And also, I mean, something else that comes to mind here is the, um, among the existentialists in the 20th century, which was the, the title of my, the subject of my last book between Montaigne and, and this present one, um, the quarrel between Camus and Sartre, which was over all sorts of things to do with politics, but one of the, um, oh no, it wasn't Camus actually, the quarrel between Merleau-Ponty, the philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty and Sartre, which concerned politics, just like the more famous quarrel between Camus and Sartre. Um, one of the things that where they had a, a kind of encounter that was quite bad tempered and, <laughs> and sort of marked a total division between them was when Melo Ponti once said to Sartre, you know, you don't have to keep firing off instant opinions mm. about everything that happens. As soon as it happens, there's a place for taking longer reflecting and you know not having to say something immediately about every event that occurs in the news and and when i read i mean now thinking back to that encounter it immediately makes you think of twitter and twitter spats and sure. all these things that we now live with and the thought of jean paul sartre with a twitter account is <laughs> mind blowing because <laughs> he would have done just that i mean you know it's I have a lot of respect for him in all sorts of ways, but I, I, I shudder at the thought of him having a Twitter account and immediately putting forth a, a political or philosophical opinion about absolutely everything that happens. So, I mean, that little debate between them, I think, is very telling in from our point of view. Yeah. The, but how the... long? Yeah. How long do you need to reflect between, you know, before firing off? I, I agree. I think we do way too much. Instant, yeah, I, I, I suspect we, I suspect we might think some think differently of some of these philosophers if they had access to the tools that we had today. You know, the the difficulty of publishing, the difficulty even of writing things down, the time span and the 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 the, the, the runway that they had on some of these ideas. It gives us the sense that these were fundamentally deliberate. Uh, patient, self-controlled individuals. And I do wonder if they had access to social media, if it might take some of the shine off of who they were. And we might go, oh, they were, Aristotle was a little bit more like us than, than, we, than we think. Yeah. I mean, I think we can assume that Socrates would have refused to tweet because if he, <laughs> he refused to write anything down, he would have probably refused to tweet as well, but he might have you know, he might have had a YouTube channel or, or a podcast, who knows? Yes. He, well, he was, I think uh, his, his way of thinking actually is quite conducive to the medium of podcasting and that what he's doing is asking questions and he's pre yeah, presenting and us dialogue. these dialogues. Yes. Mm, yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. So, so going back to your roof beams and this new book, I suspect uh, one, one thing you might carve there that I thought was quite beautiful in the book is that that line only connect tell me what that means only connect yeah that comes from a novel by em forster howard's end and one of the characters says it in fact refers to that idea repeatedly and and forster made it a kind of epigraph on the, the to the title so it was very important to him what he meant by it, well what the character means by it is because she explains it, this is Margaret Schlegel in the in the book, that it means she's talking about another character who doesn't see, for example, the consequences of his actions 
he doesn't see any relationship between how he feels about things and the fact that other people might feel bad about things that he's done or, you know, might feel similar things. And he also doesn't connect ideas within himself. So he's a he's a hypocrite. He's hmm. divided within himself because he doesn't recognize his own motives in doing things. So that's what she you know means by it. I think for Forster, it meant all of that. And also um, a more general connection in personal relationships. He described himself as a humanist. He was a member of humanist organizations. But he said that for him, being a humanist mainly meant people that he'd loved, friends, things that he'd been interested in. I mean, connections with all sorts of things in the human world. Um, and for me, it means all of that as well. Um, and also, I kind of took it as a bit of a motto for myself in the book, because what I wanted to do was to make connections between different forms of humanism as well. I, it's a word that can mean all sorts of things, humanism or humanist. Uh, there's, I mean, I can come on to the sort of various meanings of it, but um, I wanted to explore the connections between them. So only connect for me meant find the points of dialogue the points of interaction between these different kinds of of humanism and see where it leads us rather than as sometimes is is done well you know there's this kind of humanism that and this and they're all they just happen to share a word it doesn't mean anything beyond that and i thought it did mean more than that and i think there were interesting things to explore in those connections so it's it's doing a lot of work for two words I might just, if I was going to write a motto on ceiling beams, I might just have only connect because if nothing else, it would be quite short. It would be quite easy if I changed my mind to, <laughs> to rub it off. Is it also the idea that that all human beings are fundamentally connected in some way, that our actions impact each other, that our ideas influence each other, that we should go through the world thinking about, you know, someone and some things other than ourselves yeah it it touches on that other quote from terence that that we've been mentioning um i am human and find nothing human alien to me because that also is saying that we're all connected um and you know i think i mean it's just undeniable we're very very social creatures we write from birth you know I mean well before birth I mean you know we absolutely are born into a close relationships sure. with those around us I think uh, that is so fundamental to who we are most of us you know I mean it can go it, there can be damage to those relationships things can can become um, damaged in in that in that part of our lives but um, yeah I think that we are such social creatures and also it's it grows in in a larger dimension because we have things like writing for example and reading which means that we can also connect with people who are long dead or people that have said things in other languages but then they can be translated and so we can read them and we can listen to them and um, that enormously expands the circle of our connectivity and um, very much to to the to the good, I think. I mean, I think this is uh, this is all wonderful and should be encouraged and and developed and explored as much as possible because it's I'm... it is yeah. I mean, it's yeah. It it is who we are, but I think we've we've worked on that side of ourselves over time and expanded our range, if you like. I'm I'm having uh, Peter Singer on the podcast in a few months. I've had him on oh, before. Right. I'm having him on again, but it's like the the 30th or 40th anniversary of of his first book, which uh, is called The Expanding Circle, which I I thought is actually a, a kind of a, a great. It's a great actually encapsulation of I think one of the core ideas of Stoic philosophy. Also seems like a core idea of humanism itself is is this is our ability to expand that circle of what we think about, what we care about, what we're connected it's to. It's expanding a circle of concern, isn't it? As, as yes. For him, it's, yeah. And um, yeah, at one point, actually, I was going to steal or borrow that for the title of one of my chapters, but it ended up changing to something different. But yeah, very much so. 
Uh, and you you have Vonnegut at the beginning of the book. He sort of defines humanism as basically doing things and caring for other people with no hope of reward after death. Yeah, he says, I've tried to behave decently, you know, despite how, yeah, not not for a reward after death, but yeah, just for for its own sake and for and is, others. Isn't that fundamentally the journey the journey of humanism, you know, religion makes it clear why you should do certain things, right? Do them because God said so, do them because God will punish you, do them because, uh, you know, society will crumble, do them because, uh, do them or don't do them because, you know, uh, you will go to heaven or you'll go to hell, um, do them because we said so, basically, right? And humanism as I take it, is the intellectual journey over thousands of years of really smart people who found that to be insufficient or unsatisfying, and they're struggling to come up with, in the end, similar codes of conduct and advice, similar definitions of decency in many cases, but without without the, because I said so, or because you will burn in hell for all of eternity if you don't. I should say in answer to that, one of the things is that is central with my book is is not only talking about the definition of humanism, which is centered on discussion of religion. So there's the best known meaning of the word humanism in in the English language, English speaking countries is um, is is choosing to live um, finding one's meaning as well, sense of meaning as well as one's moral um, motivation, if you like, from uh, from factors other than uh, scriptures that are of divine origin, you know, the institutional religion or really anything that is, has a um, su extra human or superhuman source. In other words, sure. we find it in ourselves we find it in our relationships that's usually what takes the place of of a religious commandment but uh, there's a whole humanist strand several humanist strands which uh, don't really center around the question of religion at all they don't really center around the question of supernatural belief but what they do have in common is finding the the center of concern is this human connection human relationships and that includes the moral dimension so there's there's a focus on um, our moral connection to each other and our cultural connection to each other, whether it's arts, literature, science, science also being a very very much a human activity, but um, but that is where the the centre of a humanist concern is in all sorts of different kinds of humanism. The the one that's most different, if you like, from the the secular humanist view is is the long tradition of literary humanists. I use that term kind of loosely to, to talk about all the people who um, study the humanities because the mm. meaning of humanist that was um, dominant through the Renaissance and, and remained so for a long time and still is uh, one of the meanings of humanists is a specialist in the humanities, somebody who reads, writes, teaches, passes on the, the cultural study of the humanities in all its variety. And there's no, that doesn't necessarily mean anything in connection with religious views or views about the afterlife or expectations of the afterlife. But what it does have is whether or not they believed in God, whether or not they believed in the afterlife, those humanists did have a tendency to be writing about the human world and about culture, relationships with each other, moral, the, the moral life that is centered on the, you know, the present world, the, the world that we have around us and the human world, rather than matters of theology, which were considered quite properly to be dealt with separately. So Montaigne is a, is a good example of someone who says, look, I'm sorry, there's not very much about theology in my book, but, you know, this is a human book, meaning this is a book about the human world, not a book about the, the, the world of theology. And he says, and he's fine with that. That's what he wants to do because we can, and he compares it to the way that royalty, which is the realm of the gods and theology or God in his case, um, 
is set apart and quite rightly and then the world of the commoners is the world that that or the minor nobility is the world that he counts himself part of and it's right that royals should keep separate so what he's saying is it's right that theology could should keep separate and for him it's the world of literature and people and behavior and what it is to be human is is what he's interested in so yeah i think that's more fundamental in a way than the the actual question of um whether people believed in in god or not and whether they believed in an afterlife or, or not it's a matter of what they focus on well that is what was so sort of radically transgressive about montaigne is he said i'm not going to think about these enormous existential questions uh or religious questions necessarily but i'm gonna i'm gonna explore what it means to be a person in the world and uh, some of the questions are mundane some of them end up i think transcending to a sort of a higher plane but he goes so deep into them and he's so fascinated by them that it it, it actually does become sort of an elevated work but um he 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 he's instead of looking up here at the heavens, he's looking down here or a, a directly at in the mirror at the person across from him. And it, it's kind of remarkable how unexplored that territory was, at least accepting the Greeks and Romans. Yes. And he wrote about it in that tradition. He was a great admirer of Plutarch, especially, mm -hmm. and uh, his interest in human life and behavior. But he wrote about himself, his own experience in a way that was seems much more modern and it's much more connected um with i mean there was no such concept as psychology at that point but in a way that's what it feels like when you're reading it you feel like he's looking at his own behavior and that of others and and being a kind of in-depth psychologist about it but then just when he seems to be at his most profound he'll go and say something about his digestive system and how how that's you know working a bit strangely or something and then but of course, that's important to him, too, because he's one of the people that one of the first really to write so much about the body and about bodily experience, because we're not disembodied minds. We don't mostly experience ourselves as disembodied spirits or souls. We're we're embodied creatures. And Montaigne certainly gives you that. I mean, he gives you more of it than you want sometimes. Too much information. But yeah, he's uh, that he he writes wonderfully about that. Well, he's he's fully in touch with himself. So these things aren't off limits because they're human or sinful or gross. Um, and yeah, maybe some of them we might say today, this is an oversharer or a person with poor boundaries. But but he is interested in all the facets of human life in, in almost a, a, a Whitman-esque, like a Walt Whitman kind of approach where he's just He's just in love with and fascinated by and celebrating the human form, literally and figuratively. And like Whitman, he says, in effect, I mean, he doesn't say these words. He says, I, I contain multitudes. I'm you know, complicated. I mean, that's, that, that's Montaigne in a nutshell, that line. So important philosophical question for Montaigne then. Uh, is he playing with the cat or is the cat playing with him? If we had an answer to that, it would spoil the fun, wouldn't it, really? Because that's he just he just asked that question. He just wonders about it. <laughs> the question I think yeah. the, the question that we have come to learn about cats that he didn't really have as much uh, sort of biological or uh, anthropological information about to me is um, do are do we own the cat or does the cat own us? Right. Like, uh, did we domesticate the cat or did the cat and the dog domesticate us? Yeah, well, it, and I think and I'm, this is not an area I'm expert in at all, but I gather that there's been quite a bit of research into how dogs and humans, especially cats, too, probably, but especially dogs and humans, how they co-evolved. And you could almost say that they domesticated each other because it was a well, it's a symbiotic relationship, really, isn't it? But because of that, we've we've actually changed our path of evolution we've we've developed in a certain way because of that relationship being so important well and it, it seems That's like i understand a... it i mean this is not yeah i don't know anything about the 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 details of that scientific research but I, that's been my impression well no it, it's funny because it seems like such a silly question 
And then it actually brings up, it, it actually fundamentally changes your relationship with nature because you realize man is just an animal and animals have relations with each other and co-evolve and have interdependencies. You know, there's the, the bird that, 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 you know, sits on the back of the rhinoceros eating the bugs or whatever. And we understand that they're related to each other. Uh, not one is not necessarily higher or lower than the other, but, but a human can, can so easily think that we're the center of the universe, that we're the special animal in the universe. And then you, you understand, oh, hey, the cat selected us and sees us as a tool to get what it wants. And... Yeah, well, actually, that's, that, that comes as no surprise to any cat owner. Because, or I use the word owner quite yes, wrongly I, there. Yes. Any, any Co -resident. That line that cats, cats don't have owners, they have staff. And <laughs> it's like, you're there to serve the cat. That's very clear with cats. But yeah, I mean, I think actually Montaigne's line about who knows if I'm playing with the cat or the cat's playing with me is a very good example of that only connect idea. It's exactly what Forster was talking about is look at things from an, as best you can from another point of view. Think about how the world looks to another consciousness. And the extraordinary thing for Montaigne writing in the 16th century was this leap into wondering how the world looked from a cat's point of view. and being prepared to kind of shift that center of consciousness between himself and the other creature looking back at him and um that is certainly that's that's certainly what you know forster was talking about in in that those lines that he gives to his character there and and couldn't you say this is also what he's doing in his essay on cannibals and his writings about the native peoples that were just being discovered in America at the time that he's writing, he's one of the first and one of the few, unfortunately, Europeans who bothers to think, who are these people? How do they think about the world? How are they and operating? And how does France look to them? So he yes. reported on these Tupinamba um, people when, you know, what did... The questions that they were asking about how things were done in France, like they were astonished that, you know, rich people would sit gorging themselves on food while the poor were begging and starving outside. And they just couldn't. That was that. I mean, exotic doesn't even begin to capture how how they felt, according to, you know, what we know of from Montaigne about that conversation. Um, that was so completely alien to them you know and 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 there was another question that they asked about having a boy king because the the king of france at the time was was a young boy and they were that seemed very strange to them so Ridiculous. yeah 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 no he was always fascinated by diversity the diversity of opinions the diversity of cultural assumptions of of ways of doing things and everything right down to hairstyles and, you know, what <laughs> what what people in different cultures did. Yeah. Well, yeah, you, you only connect. It's, it's sort of seeing those people as human beings as opposed to, say, obstacles or targets for conversion or uh, lower forms of human beings. There is, uh, is that perfect, but there is at least an interest or an empathy, a, a, a sense of human connectedness that it not only uh, hopefully would make one less guilty in say committing atrocities, but also by thinking about what someone else thinks about you, you come to perhaps understand yourself better. For instance, hey, yeah, it is kind of ridiculous that there is a boy king in charge of all of us. And is he really, you know, the, the vessel of God, et cetera? You know, by, by thinking about other people's questions about ourselves or the cat's perspective of us, we also get a better perspective of ourselves. Yeah, it's that, it's the, the gaze of another consciousness or the gaze of another being that, uh, yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's interesting to be talking about Montaigne uh, you know so much in in this conversation because he features a lot in in well not a lot it's it's kind of a half a chapter but then it's it's a book that covers masses of stuff so nobody gets True. much more than that it's um he features as a humanist in the role of a humanist in the new book because i wanted to although i'd written so much about montaigne before in the book that's about him i um i wanted to think about him specifically as a humanist what what parts of him are are humanistic and really he was a figure who 
took the humanist tradition as it had been up until that point, where it had been on the whole quite reverential of the Latin and Greek classics and quite, um, you know, certainly very much interested in morality and education and forming the human character and and all of these things. But he takes all of that and also continues to write about such things, but he changes it into a much more questioning and open-ended and sometimes critical um, style of thought about it. And, and he asks difficult questions and he, he turns things around all the time. That's the, that's the thing that he's so good at, whether it's shifting between the cat's perspective and ours or or looking at some of the classical authors that the humanists had had long been so um, almost revering, like almost like gods, which like Cicero, which was a particular, you know, the sort of idol, um, and him saying, well, actually, some of Cicero is quite boring, you know, it's like he's nothing but wind. Um, but then he, you know, he was such a good classicist himself. He he used these quotations. The book is full of quotations, but he's often turning it around and saying, or he'll quote something and then he'll say, but wait a minute, you know, there's another way of looking at it. There's another perspective on that. Uh, so he's a very, he's quite a pivotal figure in the history of humanism, I think, because it's partly with Montaigne that we see the the more classical focused humanist tradition starting to become a more personal thing, a more um uh, he's not the first to do this, but asking a lot of questions and asking difficult questions and and not taking things at face value. And um, and of course, just all, also making it much more about what it's actually like to be a human being, what it feels like to be a human being, rather than it being more of a purely kind of literary, cultural, moral matter. But but it becomes much more. Yeah, it becomes much more human in a way with him. So it's, it's kind of a turning point. Well, one of the things I think that's interesting in the book is you, you start about Terence. You start with Terence, who we've been talking about, this sort of uh, slave in Rome who struggles, uh, gets his freedom, becomes this beautiful writer, talks about what it means to be human, and then you know, basically, two thousand years later, you're talking about Frederick Douglass, who's on the same journey, uh, whose humanity is not fully recognized. But then his ability to articulate, uh, explain, uh, convey his humanity, not just through the written word, but as you as you note, he's a, a master of the medium of photography, understanding how to, to show himself as a person. Um, just how much the, the, the struggle of humanism has also been defined by people trying to get others to recognize their humanity, to be included in the definition of exactly. humanity. Yeah, yeah, it, that's very much the case with, and it's so powerful in Frederick Douglass reading his autobiography and also his his speeches and, and uh, other writings. And he was a great speaker. He was using, you know, a lot that was many sources, but the classical tradition was was very much... Um, sure. He was a master at it. Um, yeah. And, you know, it is the the people who sort of start to speak up. There's also, of course, women who were um, not regarded as fully sure. human in effect. I mean, it's, you know, you yeah. could certainly say that there's uh, in the in the classical world, there's the great, the famous speech by Pericles in Athens at, near the beginning of the war with Sparta, where he gives a speech at the funeral of some of the people killed in Athens. And he says, he speaks about how wonderful it is to be an Athenian because, you know, everyone is free and there's this great freedom and there's a harmony both within individuals and and in society and everybody's engaged in public life. And, and, and then, and he completely fails to mention the, the enslaved people who make all sure. this possible. And he does mention women at the very end of it to say, of course, none of what I'm saying applies to you because a woman's only virtue is to be the least spoken about possible, whether in praise or in blame. And that's it. You know, that's kind of all they get because, you know, whereas your your fame, your name was so important to, to, to the sort of free 
born Athenian citizens who were male, a, a woman should never be spoken about. So there was this, the great virtues of women were to be um, silent and modest and chaste. And, you know, I mean, it's all negative, it, they're negative yeah. virtues. And so you get these voices a little bit, you know, a few voices in the um, 14th, 15th, 16th century start to sort of of women start to to question this um and by the time you get to the enlightenment era you've got mary wollstonecraft saying actually all virtues are human virtues and that includes whether it's their gender the, there might be you know particular virtues which which are developed by mothers in you know looking after children there might be differences in duties you say. so that's a sort of interesting comparison that she's making between duties and virtues but even if there are it's all part of the whole picture of human of human virtues and and it's not you know a big positive set of virtues for men and then this little negative set of virtues for women so um and and yeah so it's very much a story of of kind of expanding that was actually the the chapter where i particularly focus on that um was the one that was going to be called expanding the circle and and i ended up calling it the human sphere it was this, this um great uh, line from not from Mary Wollstonecraft but from Harriet Taylor Mill who lived later in the mid 19th century wrote um, wrote this um, article in which she she talked about the people talk about a proper sphere for women meaning you mm. know a sort of a sphere that's appropriate to them but she says no it's the proper sphere for all human beings is the largest and highest of which they're capable so it's 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 the full sphere for all and i thought that was such a a great way of of putting it this sort of the full sphere that um so yeah i that that became the human sphere so yeah yeah, yeah very much so i I've, i always found it interesting that uh, musonius rufus he's the teacher of, of epictetus he he has this interesting essay or speech where he's talking about whether um daughters should be taught philosophy and wh whether the, the virtues are the same for men and women. And, and he's sort of remarkably progressive on it. But spe speaking of what we've been talking about, about thinking about animals, he makes this analogy and he goes, look, you don't care whether your hunting dog is male or female. You care whether it catches uh, what it's trying to catch. And he says, it doesn't matter if a horse is male or female. What matters is if it's fast. And his argument actually was that virtue was relatively genderless. I think he would have liked this distinction that you mentioned earlier, which I want to read more about, this distinction between duties and virtues, right? Because the role we might play in society might be different um, because of a culture, because of our choice, because of you know the circumstances we're born in. But courage is courage, justice is justice, wisdom is wisdom, and, and uh, temperance is temperance. Yeah, I'm having problems with the audio. Oh, sorry. So I'm afraid I I lost I lost some chunks of that. So yeah. um, I I I was I was saying and and it, this is being recorded on my end, so we can get the full question. So I'll just give you the gist of it. But basically, I was saying Musonius Rufus, who's Epictetus's teacher. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's okay. better now. Yeah. Right, good. I've got because one of the things I lost was the name, so I was desperately thinking, right. who are you talking about? So, so, so <laughs> and Musonius, yeah, no, I didn't know. Musonius Rufus was basically saying that. Um, uh, you don't care what 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 gender a hunting dog is. You care whether it can catch the rabbit, or you know. He says you don't care uh, if a horse is male or female. You care whether it's it's fast. And his his point right. was, I think he would have liked the distinction you made between duties and virtues. But I think the point was that virtue was virtue. It, it didn't actually have a gendered component. That's something we've made up. Yeah, yeah. That's that absolutely. That's a very strong argument, and it kind of. Um... It, it links to the idea. I mean, we're going to be going back to Montaigne again um, because, you know, he talked about each. Well, he said, you know, each it's translated as each man bears the entire form of the human con condition. But of, of course, the, the meaning is. I think each human, sure. each individual ba bears the the entire form of the human condition. Um, at the same time as we're tremendously diverse. So those two ideas go together. Montaigne is fascinated by diversity, but he also said there's something, the essential humanity 
within us is the same for all. So each of us can represent to some extent um, the, the essentially human, which I think is a really interesting idea. And again, when it comes to men and women, Montaigne, you know, sometimes he he can say things about women which which certainly wouldn't pass muster these days and um, do seem rather, you know, he had his failings. Um, but then some of the time he says about women, you know, really, if they didn't have such different education, different upbringing and much more limited upbringing, as it generally was, um, they wouldn't be any different from men in yes. essentials. I mean, it's it's, uh, you know, if so, that's a kind of you know, critical way of thinking about how we become what we are, because that also is part of the story which various humanist writers started to look at is, and Frederick Douglass talked about this as well, is, you know, how um, our experiences and our upbringing and the things that we suffer change us and affect us and we develop through what happens to us. So it's it's important to, to look at that and... Uh, and to think about how things could be different if so it's important say for the enslavers to to think about how they assume that they have a perfect right to do it but and to live in that way but they themselves would be very different if they hadn't had the privileges that they had why do you think we struggle with that so much so first off you know recognizing that there's not humans who deserve to be own other human beings and then you know that commoners and 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 the aristocrats are not different than each other than that uh you know black and white let's say or male and female and then even today i mean it's not like this struggle is over we we, we clearly have major problems as a society recognizing the fundamental humanity of people who have different sexual orientations people who perhaps don't identify, you know, we were just talking about male or female, that whole dichotomy is is unfamiliar or uh, insufficient for for people all over the world. Um, there's obviously people who are, are, who are trans. Why is it so hard for humans to accept or see or celebrate the humanity of other human beings? I can imagine, you know, various explanations that would be, you know, kind of looking at our origins in small social groups that were sometimes competing with other social mm. groups. And therefore that it's, it's, you know, there's a tendency to look after the in group and um, not to recognize the humanity of the out group. I mean, I, I think there's, you know, there's historical reasons for that. Um, I mean, I'm talking about going back into yeah. as we were evolving to be the creatures that we are. Um, but on a on a more sort of immediate level, I mean, it, I think there's a kind of imagination that is needed to to transcend, to ask questions of the mm. received ideas that you grew up with, to think about how the world would look to someone else, to different eyes. Um, none of this, we're not born with any of that. We, there's a lot that we're not born with in that we develop through our early lives and our communities and our education. And so those things are important. It's one of the many reasons why those things are important to us, I think. Yeah, it, it, you can you can so easily take your own worldview for granted and assume you are the default. Right. Um, I, I was writing about this the other day, you know, um, my entire life. Uh, the color nude, right? The color N-U-D-E, nude, uh, was just assumed to be the color of roughly my skin, right? Like we think of the color nude in America as like skin like yours and mine. But that's obviously not the color of millions, if not billions of people who are alive in the world. And you, you just assume that's the way that it is. And then the power structures reinforce your simple or unexamined assumption. And so it continues. And then when someone suggests otherwise, people feel threatened. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's, there's always a, um, there's a, there's a painful part of a learning process when you're ex 
it's exactly that expanding the circle you know it it takes an effort of imagination of thought of of challenging your own especially if the situation of course is advantageous to oneself and you're mm. part of the uh, the privileged group rather than the, the non-privileged group um yeah all of that is yeah all of that is uh, is a challenging process but that's all the more a sign i think of how how important it is by the way that that color nude i've never heard <laughs> I've Maybe this is an American that. thing. Maybe that it's American must be an thing. American thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a new one to me. But yeah. Oh, yeah. I like, would imagine that that's been challenged um, recently because, I, yeah, it's obvious what the problem with that is. Yeah, well, yeah like it, nude would be a color for garments. It would be a color for crayons. It would be a color for makeup, for instance. So, like, you know, they would say this is the nude color. This is This is the base color. And it's assuming that everyone is white, which, of course, they are not. Right. Well, yeah, I assume I assume that that's uh, that the days of that phrase are uh, numbered, I should hope, because it's a, it's a very big problem with it. I mean, a, another one that that is quite common, right? You walk into a room and you say, hey, you guys. Right. And, oh, and that, yeah, that 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 assumes that everyone in the room is a guy. And it's probably been a safe assumption for most of human history that in any work conversation, you know, you guys was a. Uh, uh, not just an appropriate, but an accurate phrase. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. I think I, I read something just recently about about that that phrase and and trying to, you know, people who are trying to get rid of it yeah. <laughs> from the language. Yeah, I, I'd never thought about it. It's funny. I I mean that phrase. I I do of course we use it too. Although I yeah. suppose it's an American one really, but we've picked it up. Um, but yeah, and I, isn't the movement is to try and get. Uh, your or or uh, yes. I grew up in Australia, and in Australia they say "yous" mm. quite often for that for the plural "you" instead of "you guys." So there's lots of alternatives. Quite yeah, like yous, I think it makes sense. Y- y- y'all may might be uh, might be y'all might be is the, good the as well. Thing. It's such a great yeah. it's such a great word though. Yeah, yeah, y'all. I, I yeah, <laughs> I like that a lot. But but uh, I I love how to live. It's it's one of the most popular books in my bookstore here in Texas. I have this little bookstore. But you grew up in a in a, in and around bookstores, didn't you? And then you worked in them. Yeah, yeah. My dad was a. He, well, he's retired. He's still alive. He's a, he's retired for many many years. But he uh, is a um, bookseller. He worked in university bookshops in several different parts of the world. My mother's a librarian, so you know you could see that I didn't have much hope of escaping the world of books. It's uh, <laughs> it was everywhere, and they always had books around everywhere. I mean, they were you know they're great readers, they uh, great library users, book buyers. I mean, the house was always full of books, and even when we spent quite a lot of time traveling, even when we did, there were always heaps of books coming with us. So I. <laughs> How did growing up around books shape you? Uh, I well deeply because I mean I was lucky to have have so many books around. I didn't I didn't know that it like a lot of things. I didn't know that that's not how everybody lived. I mean I didn't think about it. But um, I started reading at an early age. I don't remember learning how to read. I mean I just seemed to have picked it up at some early point. And even before I could read, I had picture books and in fact my earliest memory I think this is pretty much my earliest memory in life was we were doing a trip around America on Greyhound buses which was a a great thing to do in the 60s you could get 99 days of unlimited travel for 99 dollars so this was my (laughs) I was about three three years old even younger and my earliest memory is of being on one of those buses and having a book a picture book which was about these animals you know, a different a badger and a hedgehog or something who stole a big red fire engine and then drove it away, a toy one, and it got out of control and they ended up in a thorn bush at the bottom of a sloping road. And that was the, the drama. And I just remember that, that book and sitting reading it on a Greyhound bus. So wow. <laughs> that, I think that says a lot about the role of books in my life and also travel. Where did you go in America on this trip? Every, almost everywhere, really, because we 
they wanted my parents wanted to make the most of this 99 days for 99 dollars so we'd <laughs> we'd sometimes go on long rides just so that you know we'd have a, a night's sleep and then see somewhere and then go on to somewhere else or stay I mean we stayed in places in between um so covered a, a lot of territory starting in starting in that trip which of course I don't remember because I was very small but starting in Montreal I think we started and uh then traveled down through the east coast and round through Texas your bookshop wasn't there yet at that point and uh California and then sort of weaving around a little bit through the Midwest and then back to New York and from there back to the UK. Wow. Yeah, my, my favorite story from the Stoics is uh, Zeno as, as a young man. Uh, he goes and he visits the Oracle at Delphi and the Delphi says, you will become wise when you begin to have conversations with the dead, which he doesn't fully understand until many years later, he's in a bookstore and he realizes that this is the conversation we can have with the dead. We can talk to the dead through the books we read. Exactly. A another figure that uh, is in my new book is, uh, in fact, he's in the first proper chapter after the introduction, yeah. is Petrarch, um, 14th century absolute book maniac. Uh, you know, Maybe the greatest book them. lover of all time. Yeah, 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 arguably. I mean, really, you know, he, it, all manuscripts, of course, in those days, but he acquired them, copied them, transcribed them, edited them, and wrote a lot himself as well. And he was just sort of mad about books. But he uh, also wrote a lot of letters, and he wrote a lot of letters to his friends, huge network of friends, often urging them to go out collecting books for him. Um, but he also wrote letters addressed to his favorite authors of mm. the of ancient Rome and of the past, Cicero being prime among them. And he addressed, you know, in where normally you would put your address, the place you were writing from, he put uh, from the land of the living. So it was these were his letters addressed from the land of the living back to the land of the dead from which he had had the the words of these authors, you know, from the land sure. of the dead to the land of the living. So it was, yeah, a wonderful idea, I think. that That's really important because I think too often people see reading as a one-way conversation. And in fact, <clears throat> the great conversation, uh, as they call it, is the, in, the interplay or the exchange between the author and the reader, and then the reader and other readers uh, it, it, it should be a debate. And if you, uh, I, you, you know, you note this a, a handful of times in the book, um, you know, writing in the margins, uh, underlining, you know, the disagreeing, if you're not disagreeing with the people that you're reading, you're either reading the wrong books or you're not reading aggressively enough. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, I think uh, Montaigne compared it to a tennis match. So mm. it's like writer and reader are, uh, you know, in a conversation, in an exchange, and yeah, that's beautifully said. Uh, although tennis didn't uh, wasn't the kindest game to the Montaigne family. No, it wasn't. No, and it was it was the tennis at the time involved a very hard ball, I think. And uh, his brother was hit in the head by a tennis ball while playing the, the jeu de pomme you know, sort of tennis and um, felt fine at the time. But in fact, it gave him a brain hemorrhage and he uh, just died suddenly a day or so later. So it killed him. So, and yeah, it's so amazing worry. that, that Montaigne would use a, a tennis metaphor to describe something then so nice as reading and writing. Uh, yeah, that's a, that is a, that I think that's the perfect place to close the, uh, the fatal tennis accident of the Montaigne family. Yes. Yes. I wasn't expecting to, uh, to land up there, but that's the nature of a conversation, isn't it? It, it is. You don't know where it it's going to take you. Uh, well, Sarah, I love your books so much. And, uh, this has been a long time coming and you can see, I, I've put some miles on this galley of how to live over the years. And I think this new one is wonderful also. And thank you so much for writing them. 
thank you very much and thanks for, for talking to me. I really enjoyed that.